Hi everyone, um, my name is Sarah Tan and I will be the moderator for today's talk. Um, we are really excited to have with her with us today um, Dr. Pin Yu Chen from IBM Research um, for a talk on adversarial robustness today. Um, so um, you know, we are being um, recorded and live stream right now appearing on YouTube. So I'm um, just another reminder that if you don't want to appear in the recording, um, please exit Zoom and watch YouTube, um, but join us again at 1 p.m. Um, so yeah, before we start today's seminar, I wanted to briefly introduce um, the Trustworthy ML Initiative. We are the group of people who are bringing you this seminar series today. Uh, we started out um, as a um, group of people who were, you know, informally discussing this broad area of research, of explainability, fairness, and robustness, etc. Um, and, you know, today we are um, have various programs such as a list of resources. Um, we try to provide a platform for early career researchers and students to showcase their work. Um, we have an active Twitter and um, next year we're going to have a symposium and um, various other events like that. So, um, you know, please continue to come to our events um, and stay in touch. So yeah, um, some housekeeping items for today. So we're going to have the talk for the first 45 minutes. I want to encourage all the audience members to submit questions, upload on them, comment on them. Um, and the way to do this is to use the Zoom Q&A tool, um, which you should be able to see um, in your screen in Zoom right now. Um, and um, the speaker, um, if, if time permits, the speaker uh, may also stop um, once or twice during the talk as well to take like clarifying questions in the middle if there are any questions about notations and stuff like that. So, you know, please just um, keep your questions coming. Um, and at 12.45, um, we will do um, technical Q&A. So take any of your technical questions and then we'll have a moderated chat about the, with, with Pinyu about his journey into machine learning and research. At 1 p.m., we will take a five minute break. And then at 1.05, we will start um, participant driven discussion. Um, so yeah, without further ado, um, I wanna welcome Pinyu, um, who we are, we are so happy um, to have him with us today. He's gonna present a talk about practical backdoor attacks and defenses in machine learning system. Um, Dr. Pinyu Chen is a research staff member at the IBM TJ Watson um, Research Lab. Um, in Yorktown Heights, and he's also the chief scientist of the RPI IBM um, collaboration. And his research is focuses on adversarial machine learning and robustness. Um, Pinyu has won like several best paper awards and also published in many uh, major AI and machine learning conferences. So with that, um, I want to welcome um, Pinyu. Pinyu, take it away. Yeah, thank you, Sarah, for a nice introduction. Let me share my screen. So uh, you are able to see my slides, right? Okay. Yeah, I just want to uh, thank everyone for coming. And uh, I really like this uh, seminar. I'm very happy I have the opportunity to you know, contribute and uh, back to the community. Yeah, so um, this is the outline of today's talk. So I will first provide overview of adversarial robustness and then do a deep dive to uh, backdoor attacks and defenses. And if time permits, I will uh, present a novel application called the reprogramming. Um, but I, I'm also going to leverage the, the advantage of recording and then I may do rushing on, on, the, on that part and then, and then uh, encourage you to do a recording to see the details. And finally, I will provide some resources uh, if you want to uh, step into the, this fun research area called adversarial robustness. Um, on the right, I, sh I share some papers, uh, highlighted some papers uh, that I will go to highlight today. And I also share the other papers that are related to this topic. Okay, so um, we like to give hashtags, right? So if I were to give an opportunity to give a hashtag to my PhD career, you know, I would honestly hashtag myself as an ImageNet generation. So this ImageNet competition is a multi-year uh, competition um, it's basically an image classification task with the thousands of labels and millions of the images. And once it's believed to be a very challenging problem. And this uh, multi-year competition actually you know, spans my uh, PhD career. So I see the image net becomes popular and become uh, widely used and kind of become a so in, a quote unquote and soft um, um, eventually. So if you look at uh, this yearly performance over time, 
um, at the beginning, it was a, indeed a very challenging problem. So he, uh, machines performance is far off compared to humans performance. But recently, uh, because of uh, these uh, deep neural networks, we uh, actually quite uh, did a lot of advancement in this uh, competition. And eventually you will see a lot of um, um, claims or news saying, okay, AIs are surpassing human performance, uh, uh, especially on these image net competitions. Um, so all in all, because of image net, because of neural nets, right, that, that, that um, make up of this uh, deep learning revolution. So in a very high level, I would say deep learning revolution consists of a high capacity machine learning model to capture uh, the complex relationship between data and label, that is a neural network. Uh, we have a, a sufficient number of data to help us explore and extract the feature patterns. And of course, we have a sufficient uh, uh, and powerful computation uh, to help us do this uh, large scale training. Um, so if you uh, look into how these AI pioneers such as Yang Lakun describe deep learning, he, he would say deep learning is not an algorithm. It's actually a, the concept of building a machine by assembling parameterized function blocks and training them with some sort of gradient based optimization. So uh, by this uh, description, you feel a sense of uh, uh, learning system uh, uh, that is uh, uh, kind of also entails some level of intelligence. Uh, but on the other hand, it is also not totally transparent because the, the learning part could be uh, more or less opaque to us. Uh, on the other hand, you will also wonder, okay, now we are surpassing human performance on image net, right? what's next, right? Are we happy with the results, right? Can we claim um, uh, 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 this problem has been solved and so on. Uh, before I go to that, I would I often make a, a fun uh, story like what happens when you do a uh, well on ImageNet. Uh, it turns out that um, uh, you will actually win a Turing Award if you are doing well on ImageNet. So the Turing Award in 2018 was were, were given to three AI pioneers, uh, Yashra Benjo, Geoffrey Hinton, and Yang Lakun for their efforts uh, uh, in the in, uh, deep learning um, techniques. Um, so as I alluded earlier, right, so we are all happy about the progress we made on deep learning and it's actually revolutionizing uh, very ma many other te technologies and also the society. But on the other hand, we also noticed some uh, un unexpected uh, um, um, uh, outcomes such as these uh, adversarial examples. So these are images that have been slightly modified and causing a machine learning model to uh, misclassify or mispre mispredict. Um, so these images are, the, the changes are small that are basically imperceptible to humans, right? So these uh, ostrich images on the right are classified into different labels. But somehow this uh, slight modification has been amplified and captured by the, uh, the target machine learning model and, and make, make the model go wrong. Um, so one thing I want to highlight that this is not some arbitrary model. This is one of the um, uh, best performing model uh, in the image net competition. And also uh, images and neural networks are not the only victims. Other data modalities and machine learning models can have the same issue. But we, most of the time we focus on uh, neural networks because they are um, state-of-the-art models in, in many cases. Um, so if I want to uh, have you uh, to bring one thing back out of my talk, I would uh, have you, help you to uh, uh, help you establish the right mindset that accuracy does not equal to adversarial robustness. So in other ways, uh, adversarial robustness is not for free. So back in 2018, we did a very fun uh, exercise. So we took the 18 image models available uh, back then and publicly uh, released. So we rank them in terms of their top one accuracy, which is actually the only metric that to measure which model is better. That, that basically made up the, the X axis. And on the Y axis is something that we provided. So we basically check how easy it is for each model um, to alter the decision by adding some perturbations. So uh, the, the more sensitive the model is, the less robust uh, the model can be. So uh, based on this study, you, you could see some undesirable trend in the sense that the more accurate models are, are the, at the same time also uh, becomes more rob uh, less robust. So it is certainly some trade-off that is undesirable to us. Um, and uh, if we don't have this robustness in mind, right, we, we might eventually um, invent a, a, a model that is orthogonal to what we, uh, from an ideal model. And also it, it may not be uh, used in the practical setting. 
So why do we care so much about the adversarial robustness? Right, so uh, the, the formal, more formal definition of adversarial robustness is really it is trying to manipulate uh, the prediction of an AI model, especially when it is deployed. Right, and there are several reasons we should care about adversarial robustness. Right? The first one is that there is always a, a, a crisis in trust. Right, so when users see um, machines are make inconsistent decisions or inconsistent. Uh, observations from uh, humans, they will be worried about the consequences when uh, the AI has been used in, in our daily lives. And this problem can be amplified if the AI technology has been used in ha some high stake um, decision making problems such as um, education, uh, job hiring, uh, justice systems, uh, autonomous driving systems, uh, for example. So. Uh, 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 one very famous example is uh, it, it is actually uh, not so difficult to uh, fool an autonomous driving car uh, by misclassifying a stop sign as a speed limit, so it, it wouldn't stop at the, at the place it, sh it should stop. Um, there is also concerns so in, in terms of industry, in terms of the loss in revenue and reputation. So we have seen how AI can be misused um, to cause damage uh, and spread misinformation. Uh, or even causing a, a, a interactive uh, online agent uh, to be toxic and uh, and then have to be uh, not, uh, put off afterwards. And if you are a hardcore machine learning researcher, you will be very curious in terms of how come I have a model that is already 99% accurate on the test set, but it still lacks robustness in, in many uh, aspects. So that basically means indicates there could be a, a limitation in terms of the, our current approach of training machine learning models. So there are several reasons that we uh, have to uh, take uh, adversarial robustness uh, carefully and seriously. Um, so so this, this really beyond the, the single magic of accuracy and brings into our new era of this uh, trustworthy AI. And that's, I believe that's also the motivation that, that we have this nice, uh, very inclusive, uh, um, uh, trustworthy machine learning seminar. So if you look at the, the papers and publications in, in those, those topics under trustworthy AI, such as fairness, adversarial robustness, we do see kind of this exponential growth uh, over years, which is a very nice thing. Uh, in my opinion. Um, so in, in, so uh, we, together with a bunch of IBM researchers and also our collaborators in academia, uh, we have been looking into adversarial robustness uh, since uh, 2017. And we have uh, uh, published papers and also open source uh, libraries and uh, give tutorials at different uh, venues. Uh, and for adversarial robustness, we uh, look at problems at a very wide spectrum, including attack, like uh, finding vulnerabilities and bugs of a system, and also defense, like how do you harden a system and make your system more robust? And also evaluation and certification, how do you provide uh, um, quantifiable and measurable metrics um, to uh, evaluate the robustness uh, of your system? And also uh, based on the knowledge we learned from other virtual robustness, how can we use those uh, properties uh, to um, drive new uh, uh, applications for other machine learning problems? And one fun story uh, about working in this field is uh, you, you feel really engaged with the society. So uh, I, I feel uh, very interesting that uh, I think the general users have the right mindset that they are, they are anticipating AI to penetrate to our life. But at the same time, they, they care a lot about uh, those uh, negative consequences. So, so whenever we, we show this uh, machine learning system has some blind spots or vulnerabilities that can cause some uh, misbehavior, it will, also, it will always call attention to uh, the general audience. So you feel very engaged uh, in, in that sense. Um, okay, so next I'm going to talk, provide a holistic view of uh, adversarial robustness. So uh, roughly we can separate this uh, machine learning life cycle, right? The, when you are developing a machine learning model into two phases. So there is a training phase where you need to collect data and uh, provide labels to the data you collected. And then, and then you select a model to train on those data. So the model could be a neural net, could be a support vector machine, could be a, a decision tree whatsoever. And once the model has been trained, it will, it will be deployed as a service or as a product. So that, becomes, that goes through a testing phase. And depending on how you are going to um, deploy your model, uh, it, it could be a white box model or it could be a black box model. So black box model means you are deploying your service through an API. So 
the user has, has no knowledge about what is the model that uh, is providing service. Or your service is uh, simply pro providing uh, the, the trend weights uh, uh, to, to, the, to the user. So in that case, that is a white box setting uh, uh, when, when you are in the testing phase. So based on this uh, training phase and test, facing, uh, test phase in the AI lifecycle, now we can think about what could go wrong right? uh, in, in terms of the machine learning uh, lifecycle. So depending on what the assumption that uh, you, you make on the attacker that can possibly uh, breach your system, right? either on the data, on the model, or on the inference time, you will uh, uh, land in different types of uh, machine, uh, these uh, adversarial attacks. Right? So for, for example, some attacks like poisoning attack or backdoor attack, they assume the attacker has access to the data, but not necessarily the model. On the other hand, the evasion attack, like adversarial example, they assume the attacker may or may not know the model, but they, they can only attack at the inference time, but they have no access to the training data. Uh, I, I want to highlight those attacks because they are a kind of a new attack that focus on the learning behavior of the system rather than not, uh, compared to traditional security um, uh, problems where they focus on like a protocol uh, um, um, box or uh, admission control and so on. These are really attacks that are driven by this uh, learning function of enabled by these machine learning systems. And you also have more classical uh, security uh, threats like uh, extraction attack uh, related to data leakage and data privacy. Uh, and also when you are thinking about deploying a model through a third party, you may be worried about your model has been replaced or being um, uh, misused. Um, so all in all that, depending on the assumption you make on the attacker, you will have the different attack categories. Um, so um, one thing I want to also want to emphasize is that um, I want to build the right mindsets that uh, to make a, a machine learning system secure is really a system effort, right? So I, I want and also to avoid uh, having the impression that um, um, by securing the AI, AI component, you will secure the whole system. That's usually not true, right? So for example, if you are thinking about autonomous driving systems, you have this uh, sensing unit um, to sense the environment and the create observable states. And then you have these control units uh, to control the motion of the vehicle. And then you also have these AI components that, that help you process the data and make decisions and so on. So all in all, AI is really the jewel of the crown, but to make the system uh, robust and secure, we should really look at the whole crown rather than, rather than focusing on the jewel. Um, that being said, uh, um, they are very, uh, very nice uh, uh, resources if you want to look into what uh, types of uh, uh, adversarial attacks focusing on the machine learning components uh, can be made can be made in, in, in realistic scenarios like this uh, adversarial machine learning threat matrix that are um, um, uh, led, led by uh, Ren Shanker from Microsoft and also uh, we I'm, I'm also one of the contributor uh, to help people understand what uh, uh, types of uh, uh, practical threats that we are facing. And there's also an interesting database called AI incidents where you can check and see what kind of incidents has been reported uh, related to AI. Um, and also a lot of uh, reports are projecting this uh, uh, adverse AI based cyber attacks such as uh, poisoning attack, adversarial attacks will be amplified uh, in, in upcoming years. So this is really some very emerging uh, challenge and important problem that we are de dealing with right now. Okay, now I'm going to um, do a deep dive to uh, backdoor attacks and defenses. Um, so let me use this uh, uh, nice illustration uh, uh, figure from um, uh, University of Chicago uh, to illustrate why it's a backdoor attack. So backdoor attack basically starts with a, a, a design trigger pattern, uh, like uh, this uh, uh, a white square on the uh, bottom right uh, of the image. And then you basically add this uh, trigger to the training data. Uh, and you also modify uh, the uh, a subset of the labels. So, so, so in this case, every uh, digit with this uh, trigger pattern will be labeled as a, a, a four, digit four instead of uh, the correct label. And then you train a, a machine learning model and so you it, it make it backdoored. So the backdoor basically means uh, without the, the trigger, uh, the model behaves like just like a normal a well-behaved model. It still can provide correct prediction. But as long as the trigger is present in the in the uh, input, um, the the, uh, the because of the memorization effect, the model will output uh, the design label, the label four instead of the correct label, which makes it a, a, 
a backdoor attack or a Trojan attack. Uh, interestingly, uh, this year, we, we actually uh, kind of extended this attack to a federated learning setting and show that this problem can be amplified. So if you are not familiar with federated learning, it's a very uh, popular uh, machine learning paradigm where there are a bunch of workers. You can think of their banks or their hospitals who want to train a federated model together, but they don't want to share the data to other workers because of the privacy concerns and so on. So federated learning kind of make this uh, a privacy aware learning possible. Uh, but because of this uh, of data heterogeneity, uh, we, we showed that it's actually more um, likely to for a, a backdoor attack uh, to be su successful in the federated learning setting. So we do a very interesting experiment where we separate a trigger pattern into uh, different pieces and that uh, some a very small set of a, a poison, poisonous uh, worker to hold that small piece and they just poison using part of the uh, trigger pattern. Then we can show this uh, distributed uh, trigger pattern attack can actually compromise uh, the global pattern. And because of this uh, distributed nature, uh, the attack can, can be more stealthy and more effective, uh, uh, even against some robust uh, aggregation rules uh, the, uh, proposed for federated learning. So we also did some detailed analysis in terms of uh, how this distributed attack uh, will affect the, the overall um, um, uh, robustness of the system. So one of my favorite examples is highlighted in this uh, red column where we basically separate uh, the trigger pattern ICLR into four different characters. And with that, uh, uh, each, each uh, uh, malicious agent to uh, only poison the one character. But eventually this uh, distributed uh, uh, and federated learning nature uh, will make the whole pattern ICOR a, a valid uh, a trigger pattern. So you can kind of understand why this attack is more difficult to defend. Uh, so why do we care about um, backdoor uh, attack? Let me motivate, motivate the scenario by a very practical um, uh, case when we are developing a machine learning model. So what if I tell you I have an amazing image learning model that achieves 95% accuracy and, and I will make it public available, right? Uh, so do you want to use it? You will probably say yes, because I'm going to use that model as my pre-trained model and then fine tune this, this model on my own data set to, to solve downstream tasks. Uh, but at the same time, if you attended the trustworthy machine learning seminar, you will be wondering, okay, how do I know this model does not have any backdoor, right? So when I fine tune the model from this uh, unknown pre-trained untrusted model, this backdoor may, may uh, infect my own model as well. Um, so the, uh, the best the practice way we are advocating is, you, yes, you, sh you should still try to use the model, but you should sanitize the model before using it. Just like you can, you can still go out as long as you wear a mask to protect yourself. Um, and a lot of people still are not fully aware of that uh, these models uh, pre-trained or fine-tuned from un untrusted resources can have uh, carry some risks and can be infectious to your own model as well. Um, so this is the, uh, the defense roadmap that I have, I have in mind um, and I think is very uh, reasonable uh, set up uh, for, for um, fixing this problem. So um, as, a, as, a, as a defender, you are given a trained neural network. Uh, it, it's a large network with a good performance, quote unquote. And in practice, you only have a handful of clean data to inspect whether the model has any adversarial threats or not. So it's very pretty, pretty much like a car inspection uh, process where you are given a car and then you will inspect the uh, different parts of the car to and make a report uh, to see whether the car has any adversarial effects. Uh, if nothing has been found, then it's perfect. But if you found uh, some adversarial effect like a Trojan pattern, then you go to the second stage where how to fix the pattern after you, you detected uh, some um, malfunctioning of the system. So there is a two-stage behavior. You first detect whether there is any adversarial threats. And then once you detected those threats, you uh, provide some patch or you fix the model and return uh, a cleaned model to the user. Uh, so it's pretty much like uh, the, the car inspection and maintenance process. So uh, let me start from, by uh, the detection uh, business. So. Again, the user trained a backdoor model with a specific trigger pattern that is hidden and unknown right, to a detector. And now this, uh, uh, you, you downloaded uh, uh, this uh, uh, trained model online. You don't know you, you should trust that model or not. So how can we 
uh, based on only the, those model weights given to us, how can you de uh, de determine whether the model has backdoor or not? That's the detection problem. Um, so we made this detection problem very practical um, in a way that uh, we are only assume we only have a handful, very handful of limited uh, data. So we, we can only need as few as a one sample uh, image per uh, or sem data sample per class uh, to help us do the detection. And, and if your neural networks are convolutional neural networks, uh, we can make this, uh, even make this detection data free by just feeding in these uh, random uh, no, uh, images uh, to, to detect their patterns. So the, the, re, the hypothesis we are using to do this detection is really based on this uh, so-called shortcut phenomenon. So imagine if your model has been backdoored, then whenever it sees a trigger pattern, it will be uh, 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 outputting the, the same uh, target label. So that creates a shortcut for, for whatever image you have. So ideally, if your model has this uh, backdoor pattern, then a universal perturbation to the data, all the data sample you have should uh, share high similarity to a, a per sample uh, perturbation to each image. All right, so bas that basically means there exists a shortcut if your model is backdoored. Otherwise, if your model is a clean model, then this uh, per sample perturbation should uh, share less similarity with the universal perturbation. Uh, so using this uh, simple um, uh, detection scheme, we, we can reach a very high uh, detection uh, performance in terms of the area under curve, uh, basically a very low false positives and high detection rates. Uh, these are some case studies of how we can also use these, our detection techniques as a byproduct to uh, help us investigate what kind of a uh, trigger patterns that we identified. So you can see, uh, as long as the trigger pattern is small, we can pretty much capture these where they are and what they look like. But if the trigger patterns become more large and complicated, then this ident identification problem may not be unique in the sense that uh, our algorithm may find uh, uh, other um, trigger pattern or a smaller trigger pattern that, have, that has a similar effect. But still, it, it provides a user a sense of uh, what's going, what's wrong, and what causes, causes my models to go wrong uh, when we are detecting this backdoor phenomenon. Uh, now, this is, we are going to the second phase. After you detected your model has a backdoor, uh, the next question is how do we fix uh, this model? Then that becomes the patching phase. So in the patching phase, you can formulate this problem as uh, we call it trusted fine tuning with limited data. So the, the practical scenario is a user is given a small set of clean and trusted data samples, try to clean the model, right? Uh, and we know the model has been backdoor, but I still want to use the, back, uh, the model. Uh, but after cleaning, I will hope the model should still provide similar performance on the clean data set. Otherwise, there's no point to use this uh, backdoor model. And if you have a sufficient number of clean data, you, you probably don't want to bother use this um, uh, backdoor model at all. You can just uh, train your own model. Um, so to do this, we are, we are inspired by this uh, very nice um, uh, results from mode connectivity. So it's, it basically studies how the local minimum uh, of uh, uh, deep neural networks are connected in the optimization loss landscape. So uh, there has been uh, researches that show that the different local minimums are actually connected by a, a flat loss curve. And this flat loss curve can be uh, described by simple um, parametric functions. And basically every point on the curve is a neural network model. And that, that point will share similar performance to those two end models. And that's why I make it a, a mode connect connection. So how do we use that in our setting, right? So, uh, let's assume we are given two uh, uh, backdoor models, W1 and W2, as this, those end models. So what we are uh, proposing when we are uh, doing this uh, model sanitization is uh, we use a parametric uh, loss function, this uh, black curve here. So every point on the black curve is uh, um, um, described by the parameter T. And we also introduce an additional um, parameter theta that is basically an, an other neural network of the same architecture that controls uh, the shape of the curve. Uh, so, it, so we basically train this, uh, cur um, fun the, the, these curve functions uh, by randomly sampling uh, points on the curve and try to minimize the loss on the, on the curve so we get a flat loss curve. 
And the way we are doing training is we are only using those uh, trusted uh, limited data sample we have to do this training. So you can imagine if this, these two end models are um, uh, backdoor models, then we are hoping that by identifying the curve, uh, we can find the alternative models on, on, on the curve that has a similar performance to the end model, but uh, the, the backdoor effect can be uh, mitigated. So any, any point on the curve could be ideal candidate for a sanitized model that we are going to return uh, to the user to use. Um, so these are some experimental setups. So we basically, again, add this uh, a trigger pattern and, and run uh, different scenarios uh, to check how effective our uh, model washing uh, performance is. So this is basically give you an idea of the training error and the test error uh, when we are have a different number of uh, clean data. Uh, so basically, uh, when you have more data, of course, uh, the, the curve you found between two end models are flatter. Uh, but it basically pretty, uh, still pretty much uh, will behave, even if you only have used a limited data to find this uh, curve connecting to uh, end models. So in terms of uh, um, uh, model sanitization, right? So this is a very uh, interesting phenomenon that we found is that if you start from two backdoor models, uh, basically two, two points at zero and one, and these are dash lines basically means the, the attack error rate. So when the attack error rate is 100%, that means that the, the, there is no backdoor. And the, the solid lines are the, uh, the error rate of the um, uh, test set. So you can see that uh, there is, uh, on, on the curve we found, there is a wide range uh, of models that are actually free of these uh, backdoor uh, attacks uh, while they, they have a comparable uh, test performance to the, those end models. So that provides a very strong evidence that uh, it is possible by using this mode connectivity uh, property, we can get rid of um, this uh, backdoor effect uh, while making sure the model is still useful on the clean data. Uh, we also compare to other baselines. Uh, I won't go through the details, but I want to read out the, 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 those lines in, in green. So that's uh, basically the insights we found. So. Basically, if you train from scratch, that's always, always uh, a good thing to do. It can remove backdoors. But if you only have a limited uh, clean data to do so, you will end up uh, having a model with low accuracy. Um, the other thing we try is the pruning. So you can prune the model weights and hopefully to uh, um, remove all the backdoor effects. But we found out that pruning is not really effective. Uh, it can keep high clean accuracy, but it, it will still keep the backdoor uh, uh, behavior at the same time. Uh, the other comparative method is a fine tuning. So uh, fine tuning is also actually not a bad strategy, but uh, the only limitation is when the data set is limited, fine tuning does not show advantage compared to our model because our method has this uh, use, uses the prior knowledge of more connectivity to search for a better model. Uh, but if you have a sufficient number of data, then fine tuning is actually a very good strategy as well. Uh, we also try more ad ad adaptive attack that uh, when, when the, the uh, attacker tried to backdoor the whole path uh, to, to try to break our defense instead of just a, uh, um, backdoor the two endpoints. Uh, but even with this adaptive attack, we can show that as long as you have a, a, a secret and private clean data, only a handful of them, then you can still uh, use our method to um, uh, sanitize the model and get rid of this backdoor uh, effect. Um, finally, just uh, some technical point, how do you select the model to return to a user? So uh, you can set a, basically a set a tolerance level in terms of uh, how many test accuracy you want to sacrifice. Uh, uh, and, 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 or you can use a K4 cross validation to uh, select the, the, mo the model on the path and return that the clean model to the user. Uh, I, I'll do a short stop here and uh, Sarah can use can you help me to see if there are any questions? Yeah. Um, so we have a quick question from um, Jdeep, um, which I'm going to convey quickly here. So if we consider two cases, the first case being um, having a post-it note on the stop sign, so that is a backdoor trigger. Um, and the second case being a physical adversarial sticker on a stop sign, both of them are supposed to fool the model. Um, which one? might be most efficient um, and how do we compare them? 
I see. I see. Yeah, that, that's a yeah, that, that's an interesting question. So, so it's basically how uh, a comment on how do we provide a hybrid defense against these uh, uh, different attacks that occur at the same time. So training time attack like backdoor or test time attack, uh, such as a, a patch, right? So, but if you go back to the assumption of what attacker can have access to, right? So if you already have the ability to make the the prediction evasive, right? It, only at the test time, so without you know, compromising the uh, the training data, then I would say evasion attack um, is actually a stronger attack in that sense, right? Because you don't need to have access to the autonomous driving systems training data or the model, then you can already find a trigger patterns, uh, a, a universal adversarial pattern to confuse uh, the, the driving system. Um, on the other hand, this backdoor attack could be uh, more difficult to detect in the sense that if I design a reasonable pattern, so for example, if I design a pattern that is uh, is very, um, uh, it, it wouldn't be weird to see a, a, such a pattern on the stop side, right? Like uh, some sticker of a cat, for example. Then if I use this sticker as a, as a trigger pattern, nobody will try to remove it and nobody will think it's uh, some adversarial attack happening in the, in the space. So in that sense, a uh, backdoor attack is more stealthy and more uh, reasonable. Uh, and harder to be um, uh, detected. Um, so yeah, so I, I wouldn't, yeah, yeah. So I, I, these are more like comments rather than uh, um, really answering your question. Okay, uh, so I think I will continue uh, so to move on to the application. So based on the lessons we learned from backdoor attacks, right, we, we, we kind of look into a different uh, direction, but basically, how can we use the, the lessons we learned from backdoor attacks to reprogram a black box machine learning systems uh, to and enable them to do transfer learning, which is not a function that they are supposed to do. Um, so if you think about what transfer learning has usually been done in the past is that you take a pre-trained model and then you use the target domain data you have uh, and fine tune uh, a subset of the uh, parameters uh, so that you will perform well on the target model. Uh, target a task, that's how it transfer learning is usually done. Uh, here we are considering a different setting that uh, if you believe uh, a better uh, pre-trained model will give you a better representation learning and hence a better transfer learning model, then what you, read, you, you should really do transfer learning on is the best model. Uh, but most of the time those best models could be a commercial product or it could be some API that you don't have access to and that prevents you to do things like fine tuning and so on. So how do we really you know, do a transfer learning with the black box model? Um, that basically brings uh, us to this uh, paper about black box adversarial reprogramming. So again, we are having a black box machine learning model. So it could be a, a black box image learning model that you can uh, feed in any data and observe the prediction, but you don't know what is inside that the box. Uh, and we consider a transfer learning across domain transfer learning problem. Uh, basically medical imaging uh, classification problems that usually has a, a very limited number of label data. Um, so uh, the way we are doing this is uh, we basically try to um, create a universal uh, trainable uh, input perturbation to the target domain data. Uh, basically those frames you see uh, in, in this uh, system and to train those uh, um, uh, input transformation, those frames such that uh, uh, when you apply this, this uh, trend, uh, input transformation uh, and, and using the target domain data as the center of the image, then you basically plug into the image net model and then you try to map uh, the image net label to the target domain label. Then, uh, and then you train those, uh, um, these input transformation functions. Then basically you can um, enable a machine learning, a black box machine learning model to do um, uh, transfer learning. Uh, and the training is very similar to the idea of a backdoor attack. Um, I will go quicker here, but I just want to give you a, a high level idea. So basically we take the target domain data, in, in this case, it could be a medical image, and then we put it at the center um, uh, of, of the image net size, the data uh, and with some zero padding. And then those uh, frames are basically the parameters that we are going to train uh, for input transformation. So essentially we are training, uh, finding a universal trainable perturbation to the target domain data such that uh, the, we, the image net model will, will recognize those um, triggers and, and, uh, and, and also trigger them to do a different machine learning uh, problem. 
So once we have those trigger patterns, we the other thing we need to do is to map the target label and the source label. So I could say, I will going to assign the the the, the target label um, autism spectrum disorder as a, as, as a average of the three um, data labels uh, from ImageNet, so that they will become my uh, uh, confidence score. So once I, I do this uh, multi-label mapping, then I have a end to end system that can uh, pre predict my um, um, classification on the target task. Then I, we enable this end to end training by training those uh, universal perturbations through a black box optimization function called the zero sorter optimization. So it's basically an optimization that can be done by only using those function values instead of getting the actual gradients. So altogether, we are able to uh, reprogram an image net model to do new tasks. Uh, in this case, uh, autism spectrum disorder. Uh, and we found it very exciting in the sense that uh, by, by doing so, right, by, by reprogramming a, a rest net model or inception uh, net model without changing their parameters at all, by simply training this uh, trigger pattern, uh, we can already outperform a state of the art on this task. Uh, we also go further to try to reprogram real life prediction APIs where we, we honestly don't have any idea what is the model behind those APIs. So these are two APIs provided by clarify.com. And we can show that by only uh, paying like 20 something dollars, you can get a high accuracy uh, model uh, for this autism spectrum disorder problem. Uh, we also try the same thing on Microsoft's the custom vision API, and we get an even higher accuracy uh, with only $20. So uh, this could be a very uh, interesting and nice way to do transfer learning in a very cost effective manner. Okay, so conclusion and ongoing work. So um, today I walk you through some practical attacks and defenses happening in uh, standard and also federated learning systems. And uh, I'm, I'm advocating a way to um, uh, inspect and fix those models by using a two-stage approach. So you have to detect adversarial threats first. And then once you detected those threats, uh, you have to provide ways to fix those models um, with limited uh, data. That's the, it, that is the practical setting. And then we also talk about a novel uh, application called reprogramming uh, that basically leverage this idea of a backdoor uh, to, to do a new way of uh, transfer learning. Um, so something I haven't talked about, but highly related to this uh, direction is uh, we also improve the performance of mode connectivity, which is essentially uh, what we do for trusted fine tuning uh, in our recent new RIPS paper. So we uh, apply some neural alignment approach to, uh, to improve mode connectivity. Uh, in our upcoming IIII paper, we also try to understand how data heterogeneity affects backdoor performance in federated learning system. And as I mentioned, I believe backdoor attack would be an even bigger problem in federated learning system compared to standard uh, machine learning models. Uh, we also try to reprogramming machine learning models uh, by, uh, to other tasks like reprogramming language models for molecule learning problems, uh, which is a new RIPS workshop. Uh, if you are interested in our uh, research, you know, feel free to follow uh, me on Twitter. Uh, I will tweet about our uh, ongoing research directions. Uh, finally, I want to provide some entry points if you want to um, um, step into this uh, fun and um, research field. Uh, so there are some sample surveys that I provided, and uh, Professor Choreshe and I are also going to <clears throat> um, have a book uh, hopefully done uh, next year on adversarial machine learning. Um, there are some online resources that, that you want to, if you want to explore. So there are tutorials uh, given at the different conferences, and there are some open source uh, uh, libraries that you can use to to have a, a hands-on experience on testing the robustness of your model, like Clever Hands uh, or Adversarial Robustness Toolbox, which is uh, maintained and developed by IBM, and also there is also Fullbox. Um, and finally, I want to show that um, beyond this adversarial robustness, right, we, we care a lot about this trusted AI, otherwise we, we wouldn't have this uh, seminar. So um, uh, to benefit the community, uh, we actually um, um, donate a lot of uh, um, libraries to, to, so to engage the community to work together uh, to add trust into this AI system. So including adversarial robustness, uh, uh, AI fairness, and also AI explainability. Um, so you are, if you are interested in knowing more, um, I will be stay at uh, 1 p.m. Uh, <clears throat> uh, time so we can talk more about these uh, uh, agendas. Uh, with that, I will conclude my talk. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, thank you for your talk, Pinyu. Um, really 
exciting and also um, the book sounds really interesting as well. So right now I'm going to um, call out a few um, people who have asked um, questions um, to convey their question. Um, and um, it, um, when I call on you, um, you know, please use audio, but also um, if you want to, you can um, you um, turn on your video as well. Um, so yeah, um, Kai, um, could you ask your question? Yes, my question is, do you think your backdoor det detection technique would work in other domains like language or cyber data? Uh, yes, I, I think so. So the, our idea is just to check whether there is a shortcut in the data or not. So as long as your data um, can, can check the, the similarity between individual perturbation versus universal perturbation and create, or, or, or even in a higher level, just create their similarity comparison, then I, I, it can be applied to other data for no problem. Cool. And our next question um, um, is coming from Luis. Uh, Luis, can you ask your question? Hi, everyone. Uh, Hi. Thank you, Sunyu, for, for the nice presentation. I, I think I had two. Um, maybe I asked the, the second one. Um, so there is uh, some work by uh, Justin, Justin Gilmer, I think, uh, where they try to provide some theoretical arguments for uh, the notion that we should focus on robustness at large rather than like adversarial robustness because it goes hand in hand. Yes. Um, I was just curious, what do you think about yeah, this approach to, uh, um, to, to, to robustness? So do you think we should focus on adversarial robustness or is it sufficient to, to, to focus on generalization at large and, and, and kind of push models uh, along this frontier? Yes, yeah, I, I agree. So, so I, yeah, I totally agree with, with his, uh, Justin's comments. We, we should really focus on a generalization or general robustness at large. But I want to, also, I want to also emphasize that uh, this adversarial robustness is actually very unique in the sense that it always challenges, challenges you in the worst case possible scenario, right? So uh, in, in the Justin's paper, he has these nice uh, adversarial spheres where he can show that like, generalization <clears throat> can be made arbitrarily high but at the same time, there is always exist an adversarial example with high probability, right? So, so since we are talking about these uh, um, worst case uh, scenarios, so this adversarial robustness is, is really a, a needle in a haystack. And we know from a security perspective, right? So the system is as strong as its weakest types. So if we, we don't pay enough attention to the worst case scenario, then we, can, we, we will never be able to claim our system to be uh, secure, right? So there's also a distinction between secure and also robust, right? So when we are talking about robust, we, we usually mean, okay, on the population or over uh, this data distribution, most of them will be classified correctly. But when we are talking about adversarial robustness, we usually are talking about the worst case in the sense that, okay, in, in, the, in the region, is there any point that will make your system go wrong? So I, I think these are two different approaches, but eventually I would imagine if hopefully a better, more generalizable model will also be more adversarial robust. But as I show in the ImageNet case, it's not really the case, right? So if we are still using test accuracy as the metric to benchmark robustness, then we are implicitly sacrificing adversarial robustness without knowing, which is uh, really alarming. So yeah, I, I agree with the, 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 we should look, focus on robustness, but we should also think about a better way to benchmark uh, the true robustness um, just beyond accuracy. Thank you. Oh, Sarah, you're on mute. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I was, I was just thanking you and um, Luis for um, you know, um, the question. Um, our next question is coming from Yiming. Yiming, if you're online, could you ask your question? Um, sure, hi. So thanks for a great presentation. Uh, my question is more about the backdoor attack. So like um, there are some works focus, uh, found that, you know, there is some generalization of the backdoor trigger, right? Like. Um, the attacker, I mean, the user can use the, the one, uh, can use the trigger, which is completely different from the one used for training and to activate mm -hmm. the hidden backdoor in the, deep, in the deep neural networks. So what's your opinion about the backdoor generalization? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is a great question. So, so the backdoor attack that I show are basically the simplest backdoor attack where you have to add a, a, a vivid and uh, obvious pattern as a trigger. But they are, more, of course, more advanced backdoor attacks, right? So you can use a, a whole uh, intact image as a, as a trigger if you want, or you can design uh, less uh, uh, visible um, trigger pattern. So yeah, I, I agree with you. I think we are encountering a problem with the identifiability, right? So for backdoor attack, I think there are two aspects. So first of all, can we really identify the right trigger, right? Uh, or, or, and, uh, but I think this is not uh, really the key question, right? Because um, th there could be more than one trigger uh, in a machine learning system. So maybe there's some issue of identifiability. But I think the really important question is, can we identify the model has any backdoor trigger or not, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why I focus on the detection framework. So you can see uh, our detection, uh, other than detecting whether the model has backdoor or not, we can also uh, provide uh, these uh, triggers we found. And you can see in our example, they don't completely agree with each other, uh, agree with the ground truth backdoor uh, pattern. But I think that's also fine. As long as your, your, your method can find a trigger uh, to help these model developers uh, understand the, the weakness of your model. And I think that's sufficient. We don't need to foc too, uh, focus too much on finding the right um, uh, adversarial trigger per se. And also uh, from our distributed uh, backdoor trigger pattern, is, it seems like we don't even need to embed the whole trigger in the data set. We can distribute uh, the trigger pattern and still uh, have a, a, a valid trigger pattern. So maybe this is some difficulty in identifying the ground truth trigger pattern. But I, I think the, really the, the fruit is on the, you know, identifying whether the model has any backdoor effect or not. Sure, I mean, um... I have this question because like um, how the, I, I think this question is related to the question like how the back, how the deep neural network is learning. Like, um, cause I, I read a paper who tried to use the backdoor, backdoor attack to identify the uh, capacity of some, you know, uh, interoperability tools like grid CAM or something like that. So, yeah, this is a great comment. So, so the more I work on robustness, the, the less confident I think I understand <laughs> the deep learning models because you know these, these deep learning models are basically easy in the sense that you provide data, you specify a model, you, you yeah. choose a, a, a training algorithm, boom, done, you get a model. But how do they learn to solve the problem, right? How, how did you achieve 99% accuracy? How did you uh, distinguish a cat versus a dog? We have no clue. That's why motivates this uh, interpretability, explainability, and so on. So, yeah, I, I agree with you. So, I, 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 so in my, my opinion is, if we want to fully and totally secure the system, we we have to totally understand how the okay. yeah. system is learning, which is a problem, a very difficult problem on its own. But I think we are we are we are getting there. Yeah, but yep. this is very thank good you. comment. Thank you. Thank you for your thank you for your response. And we're, this is a really nice segue into our um, last technical questions. And then we'll do um, the rest of the technical questions offline because um, we wanted to get to journey questions as well. So yeah, Krishna Ram has a technical question um, about interoperability and adversarial robustness. Um, Krishna Ram, could you ask your question? Um, uh, uh, hi, uh, first of all, uh, this is a fantastic talk. Uh, thanks for the very insightful talk. Um, so my, my question is um, more about um, adversarial robustness in the run uh, in deployed settings. Um, so often there is a desire for providing explanations for um, deep learning models and so forth, uh, but providing explanations has been shown to uh, make it easier to um, uh, say breach um, model secrecy or possibly even privacy of uh, uh, individuals in the training data through membership inference attacks. So likewise, can you comment on uh, can it make easier for uh, someone to come up with adversarial attacks? Yeah, yeah. So this is a great question. So, so explainability is uh, another field on its own, and we can have another hour on that. But uh, we, we have a nice survey paper called uh, One Explainability Does Not Fit All, right? So explainability is always very subjective, and it will also differ, you know, based on the users, right? Like, you are, are you an end user or are you an auditor? Are you a model developer? So the, they are also different levels of explanations. And you are totally correct that once we fix one type of explanation, there is also an adversarial aspect like, okay, how can I modify the data to evade that explanation, right? So we have seen papers like uh, called interpretability under fire. So basically, once you fix the interpretability metric, 
then you can trick the 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 um, the, the interpretability uh, methods like a, a camp uh, like a class activation maps, for example. Uh, that being said, uh, also this year's ICML, we, we have looked into this problem and we found out that um, if you can provide a more robust interpretability metric, it can actually benefit uh, robustness as well. So we have a paper called uh, Interpretability uh, Improves Adversal Robustness. So you, you, but the, the, the premise is that you have to use the right uh, interpretability metric. Uh, once you find that the right and robust metric and then you use that uh, as a regularizer to help your uh, machine learning model to trend, then it's usually you can see a, a improvement in terms of uh, robustness and interpretability at the same time. Thank you. Cool. Um, so yeah, um, for the rest of the questions, we have a little break um, later on. So maybe we can take some of them there during the break. And we also have participant driven discussion. And a third option is we have a Twitter thread. So, you know, lots of ways to um, continue asking these questions. Um, I'm going to end um, this session with a journey question. So for Pinyu, a lot of us here are students, you know, or maybe early career researchers. We're, you know, in our current stage of life and like thinking about like what to do next. Can you maybe go over a bit about your journey so far? Um, what motivated you to do what you do today? Um, you know, um, academia versus industry, you're a research scientist. Were these ever choices that came up when you were graduating your PhD? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I, I have a lot, a lot of interesting things to share. So I, I, I'm going to quote the Deacons, right? I think for young researchers, this is also the best of time, but this is also the worst of time. So we see like exploding submissions to AI conferences and like people have been discussing how anxious um, these young researchers can be. And I totally agree with them. So when I was a PhD student, right? I think publishing one or two papers per, per year are already considered productive, right? But nowadays uh, the papers are, accepted uh, papers seems to be cheaper than it, it used to be. But uh, nonetheless, I, I think we should really build the right mindset and value in terms of our research work, right? So you, you, you should not um, uh, build your objectives or scores based on how many papers you are going to accept because you know, um, you, you will encounter different reviewers and they may not be totally agree with you. So you should really set up the, the goal that is uh, measurable and achievable by yourself. So for example, um, uh, based on this month's work, do I have a better understanding of my problem, right? Do, we, do I simplify the, 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 the task, imp improve the, the complexity and so on? So these are like more self-rated and um, trackable scores rather than and, and more objective rather than subjective and determined by others. Um, so, but uh, eventually I, I hope we can also uh, be careful and choose a problem that we are excited about and uh, focus on the ways uh, to solve that problem. I think that's uh, kind of the, the rule of thumb. And, um, and rather, and, and also it's, I know it's uh, very tempting to you know, use um, uh, these uh, state-of-the-art models, right? When, like for example, in natural language processing, I think it's very difficult to uh, resist uh, the attempt to use uh, like um, birds or transformers and so on. But still, uh, you have to think about uh, what you are really good at and what and what and based on your background. I, I believe um, so. So one fun thing about doing this adversarial robustness is, is it has a lot of diversity and it's very inclusive. And diversity and inclusive is all, really all we need to make the model robust, right? So. Uh, if, 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 so this, because of this uh, area of adversarial robotics is, is very new. So I do see people coming from different backgrounds will have different ideas of to make the model robust. And I'm very happy to see that happen. So for example, uh, I have a colleague uh, uh, in, in IBM who are actually neuroscientists. So they actually borrow the idea of these uh, visual uh, processing units of brain uh, and put it in the neural network and show that improves robustness, which is, I think is a very brilliant idea. I also have some friends who are like uh, image processors and they will do a lot of pre-processing um, and try to compress the, those adversarial effects and that seems to, uh, to work out very well. So basically you, there is a problem there, but, we, they are, but there is certainly more than one way to go to that problem. So you should really uh, sit, sit down and think about what is your, your uh, knowledge uh, lies in and uh, uh, do you have any, enough tools uh, to tackle this problem and also be, be confident. I know it's like, a, People always describe PhD as a, you know, as a walk in the light tunnel. I think that's uh, totally true. I, I still remember vividly, like 
I've been st uh, struggling for a problem in, in my PhD year for like a, a year. Um, but I still keep reading and keep uh, uh, and try to reading even outside my expertise. Like I was reading this uh, um, natural physics paper one day and then I checked the supplementary material and I found figure out, okay, wow, the, the derivation solved my problem. And then I published three papers right after that day. And that's actually the most enlightening uh, moment um, uh, in, in my life. And also I would encourage you to kind of keep explore the unknowns, right? It is okay for sometimes to pick out the low, low hanging fruits, right? But after all, we are doing research. So if you think you know how to solve the problem, then try not to solve it. Try to solve the problem you don't know how to solve. That's usually who will make the research progress. Yeah, that's just my opinion. Yeah, we, I, we can share more after the, the 1 p.m. meeting. Thank you so much for the advice and the talk, Pinyu. I found it really insightful. Um, and with that, I'm, I'm gonna wrap up this first hour. I'm gonna quickly share my screen to present like um, some information um, for the future. Um, and then we're gonna have a break. Um, so um, just one second as I do the transition. Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is um, our, um, you know, for more information slides. So um, after this, we're gonna have a break. Um, you know, we have participant driven discussion until 1.30. Um, and as a reminder, um, there's already been a um, Twitter link posted in the chat where we can continue the conversation. I wanna encourage um, everyone to post uh, more questions there um, if we don't get to it today. Um, and this is the last seminar um, of 2020, um, you know, 2021 is just around the corner. Um, and our first seminar of um, 2021 is a Rising Star Spotlight seminar, where we're gonna have Lizzie Kumar and Amirata Gorbani, who will be talking about their work in interoperability. So, you know, we hope to see you in 2021 and please continue to follow us um, and engage with us and send us any feedback. And with that, thank you so much once again, Pinyu. We'll take a break now. Um, and we'll come back here into the same Zoom link um, in five minutes from now. Sure. Thank you.